Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you to be here. Uh, today, I'm going to present uh, the R software package that is for interactive single cell formatting accessibility analysis. Um, this article was published in February 2021, and this is a uh, this is uh, conducted by Jeffrey the Green Leaf uh, Lab, together with Jeffrey and Grant and collaborators. So I would like to start uh, saying that this is a suite or it's a collection of software that can um, that can do uh, a real time analysis, but also advanced analysis on massive scale single cell accessibility formatting data without the need to have a high performance competitive environment. So this is very important because um, uh, many of the tools that I have seen to, to do this kind of analysis requires a lot of resources. Uh, the implementation that, that uh, this team uh, do for that includes uh, the Tenex genomics commune systems, but also the BioRad droplets uh, single cell attack Seed systems, as well as single cell combinatorial indexing and fluid and fluidic C1 systems. Um, also, uh, I would like to start uh, just talking about uh, a bit of the general of the generals and then go to the specifics. So I can I would like to mention some of the main uh, art, art features. So one of these the this the core of the package is the let's say the schematic file structure that they call arrows. So I'm going to talk a bit more about this um, with more details because it's very relevant to, to warranty the efficiency in the way that the information can, can be accessed and processed in, in all this ecosystem. Also, when we have the, the usual uh, tasks for the genomic analysis that include normalization, Dimensionality reduction, clustering, based on these formatting accessibility patterns, as well as other advanced um, data analysis that includes uh, uh, different kind of analysis that can be extended to, to the analysis of, of cell trajectories. Also, well, we can see here some samples about of the memory performance that I'm going to talk in more detail in a minute. And also, uh, how what is the main approach that the tool uses to identify clusters, as well as some, um, uh, let's say, uh, additional processes that can include in the package. So um, many, I think, mostly half of the paper is is uh, uh, showing different ways to argument why uh, they have improved the performance optimization that is designed really to work with million of cells. Uh, and well, I think that a good, a good point to start is to describe what is an arrow file, because this is, let's say, the way where there is the architecture based to access different kinds of data types. So usually this kind of tools access uh, fragment files as input, but in addition, ARC, uh, ARC, ARC can also directly convert BAM files, as you can see here, into ARO files, which enables the analysis to use diverse uh, data uh, from different kinds of technologies. So we can see here an example that this is a, let's call like a pre-processing step before to start the, the let's say the usual analysis to, to make the, the, um, the normalization, the reduction, the reduction dimensionality in the clustering and more advanced uh, analysis. So in this figure that is supplemental figure one, we can see really a lot of the details of the schematics of how work the file infrastructure for access information. So here, for example, we are looking at a, at a MAM file. So the, the arrow architecture, what says is that it splices, we split the data in different chunks of, of data. So these, uh, they use like pointers or connections uh, to, warrant, to warranty that they can access randomly different kind of information uh, that can grab different components of the analysis. So in this very beginning step where it's, let's say, uh, 
there is uh, an intermediate step to where they use the HDFI format to compute the data. Uh, it's also performing a pre-filtering step that includes, uh, I think that is one of the, of the more relevant uh, features that they have, that is one step to remove doublets, doublets in, in, this, uh, in this kind of analysis, that this is not typically incorporated in other tools. So one that they have this, um, this uh, R R R file, that is the main component of the of the approach to warranty efficiency. So we can mention some key features of these files that is designed for scalability and speed uh, to access, also facility random access to specific components. And when they call about components, they are calling about uh, a specific structure that can store different kind of data that includes, for example, the gene activity metrics, that is the one that, that can uh, store, let's say, the predictions between, between the peaks and what are the closest genes um, to the, let's say, the regulars, the, the, the circulatory elements that are playing a role here in the, in the biology question, but also they confirm this kind of type matrix that is accessibility aggregated across genomic styles. In this case, they work with a redefined opinion of 500 uh, base pairs intervals. They also can stare another component that is the peak metrics and also other kind of metadata that can include cell annotations, quality control metrics, or other attributes, including integration with other data types. So, for example, here in the in the in the letter B, the panel G, we can see a mix of these uh, of these different components that can be uh, like spliced in the data, all with connectors to different kind of of components in the data. So this is a way to say uh, they explain in the panel C that they can access, for example, uh, different uh, chromosome uh, information. And then they can, like, uh, for example, uh, operate the initial of these chromosomes independently. And then again, they can back the information that they process. Also, uh, this kind of architecture facilitates, for example, to merge information. And so they can just access the information, they perform something on that, and they can get back the information. So they have also this kind of infrastructure connected with this system that, that they simply call like arrows. And there is a specific function that is called create arrow files that makes all this process almost, uh, let's say, in the background, because we cannot see a lot of code how it indeed is performing. But you, you have free access to define, for example, what is the site that you want to create for these chunks? And also you can add a specific thresholds for clean the data because at the end, these arrow files contains clean data or pre-filtered data. So one thing that caught my attention here is that, for example, um, if I set a pre-computer quality metric to clean the data without see previously how they look the data. So I don't have a paper reference for that. So this is something that is an open question for me in this book. Next, um, they I have um, in the supplementary figure two, some of the quality control metrics uh, that they perform based on, on three different data types, the PBMC, that is the peripheral plot mononuclear cells, also the born arrow skin and progenitor cells, and also a large atlas of million cells with a diverse organ systems. So uh, here in the first in the panel A and B, this is just used to, to, to show a bit of, of compare the performance or the, or the kind of memory that is required to perform uh, this kind of data compared with a snap attack. See and with the in with the fragment file size. So here we can see that uh, according with this with this clause, they can they can they can uh, like demonstrate that the for example in the in the arc 
the RR performance it's only requires uh, a few memory to to load or, or to input this kind of data while for example the snap attack resources are a bit higher also there are another um, additional uh, plus demonstrating that even when they increase different uh, sizes of this information even with million of cells and uh, R, R can just require uh, almost 30 gigas of memory. So this is very impressive to me because you know, we see that I require a lot of memory to, to do some, some kind of quality, to compute some kind of quality continuities. They also use the, the let's say, the well state quality control metrics for epigenomic information that includes the, the transcription star size uh, enrichment scores, that is this one, an aggregate function, uh, just to look at uh, uh, what is the, the, the quality score data. We traditionally have like standard, uh, one that is predefined by the encode, um, by the encode. So usually we are expecting to see uh, different kind of TSTs, uh, depending on the tissue and also the kind of of the data that we have, or also if it's noise or not the data. But also they include the nucleosome signal, the nucleosome signal uh, to also look at the preservation of the chromatin structure. And so each one of the lines that you can see here in the um, green in all these colors is coming from each one of the different uh, data, data sets that they use as, as an example. Um, here, another thing that really caught my attention was the here in panel in panel K. You can see here the 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 data coming from the from the bone marrow from the bone marrow and also. Uh, coming from different kind of tissues, including whole brain, uh, tumors, this, this, in the hair. And you can see here that this metric that is very relevant in this kind of analysis, that, that is the transcription starts as enrichment scores. Uh, we can see it in this plot uh, when it's showing the, let's say the, the general uh, distribution of this, of this enrichment score metric. That here in the yellow, we are expecting to see uh, la, as regular recommendation a TST score uh, around seven, let's say. But you can see here that there is a really big difference between different kind of tissues. One of the the most common attention was the the testers because it is really um, around two, probably one. Uh, as well as there are other methods that they have really high TSTS score. So this is to me that uh, probably uh, this recommendation um, should be taken carefully because it looks like that it's very dependent of the of the kind of tissue. This at the end is, is the data that they do for further analysis. Then, um, yes, this is where I explain. Uh, then also they uh, check different kind of tools that they can use to make this kind of analysis. And they find that according with the, with the, let's say, the distribution of the most used tools for performing analysis, but also the tools that they consider share more of the features that they incorporate in the in art, art, they decide to compare only against a uh, signal and snap attack. So uh, one of the of the tests that they do it was to compare uh, the the database PBBMC with 20,000 cells uh, using 32 gigabytes of RAM with a with a core. So you, we can see here in the in the in the x-axis the performance of R signal and snap based in the maximum memory they require to to, to make the improved data, as well as the time that it was necessary to use to, to, do, to complete this task. So I think that really uh, the efficiency to access the data, to import and to store, is not possible because it looks like that 
it only needs a few uh, minutes or as most hours to compute even a million of cells. But here in this example, they just use the critical task, that is the input data, the dimensionality reduction and the clustering, and also the gene metric generation. And in all of the of these three tasks, uh, it looks like they are the requires less memory resources as well as time to process this information. And they do the same, but using uh, 70,000 cells, uh, increasing to 128 of RAM with 20 nodal, with, with 20 cores. So it's mostly, um, let's say that uh, is when probably signal and snap and snap equals to input data, but not in the dimensional reduction. It is a very greedy uh, task that requires some of the resources. Here, uh, they use uh, here are uh, the kind of tasks that are. Uh, um, commonly performed in each one of these steps. For, him, for example, for the input in R, it includes the creation of arrow files. And let's say like that this is the core uh, data access that they have, so it looks a lot, of, a lot of the steps. And they also perform a quality control filtering that is in some way, some tasks that are not included uh, in the data import in the signal and the not chat, but they can be performed separately. So they only added here in order to equal the conditions to make the comparison value. And also uh, they include what include what they uh, includes in the in the dimensionality reduction in clustering. And also this is also to pay attention that they perform or use different kind of techniques to normalize the data and also to, to scale the data. So this also can take time to, to be performed. And, and the gene metrics creation, uh, also they add uh, the different, um, let's say tasks that indeed here, like this is uh, one of the last steps to identify uh, clusters related with the circulatory elements, it's mostly equal in, comparing the three the three different tools that they compare so um this is a relevant point that they highlight that is how they propose inside of the or is integrated in the tool a step to to identify doublets in single cell attack data which is not common in the in the tools but what can be do also but using different or external tools with other packages. So what they say is that they employ uh, similar, similarly methods for double detection of single cell RNA seq And they do this using uh, 38,000 cells across two replicates representing 10 different cell lines. So here, the only thing that I want to highlight is that uh, they integrate this function in the package and they use the, the, the Latin semantic indexes projection together with the, the, the KNS label identification to identify a uh, synthetic doublets and, and identify, the, identify them inside of the, of the full data set. Here in the UMAP, this is um, a projection that is showing in the darker uh, like cluster that you can see here are what they um, is called as putative. Uh, doublets. So uh, here you can see here in the, in the bar, the darker it means that it is a change to be a doublet. So in the extended figure four, uh, there are some examples when they uh, are comparing uh, arc uh, with doublets and arc without doublets. So you can see here these uh, clusters in dark that are flagged as, as doublet regions. So after to remove these, they can like denoise in some way the data. So this is interesting because um, I mean it's a way to that if it's difficult to have clear close to definition, so we cannot cut, uh, catch the biological side signal. Probably this can work. Uh, so. Also, they, they uh, mentioned that even when, for example, a, a snap attack can do this too, uh, they were able to identify mostly 
of the most of the double expression in the in the data prepared for this for this uh, for this validation. Uh, so the total of double expression in this data set was ten thousand eight hundred eighty seven, and and I could identify nine thousand nine thousand seven hundred two of these doublets. Um, they state a reason for this. And they talk about uh, it's difficult to detect doublets in balancing data. So this is something also in this. It's to take into consideration depending on the data that we have. Uh, also, they say that some uh, some predicted doublets identified by, by tools like Demoslet that were not identified by R reside in the boundaries of the cluster. So this is most of the hardest uh, doublets that they challenge to detect. Also, I want to mention that regarding the identification of peaks, uh, in the context of, of this kind of analysis, uh, identification of peak regions is something wrong before the cluster identification. And I think that it's necessary just to, to understand a bit of how our signal and, and SNAP are that works to make this uh, or to process this task. So they use different collection of data to, to make, um, let's say, a theoretical distribution in order to identify where a, a peak can be identified as enriched or not in the data set. So for example, in the case of RR, they use a genomic wide type matrix that uh, gets a resolution of 500 uh, base pairs. So advantages of this is that they are sensitive, let's say, to, to data that can be low expressed. And also it captures regulatory elements across all the genome, and it can be efficiency in terms of the use of the arrow files. Uh, and in the case of SIGNAC, uh, it depends on the on the peak set, but also um, we have uh, let's say uh, uh, a full uh, peak matrix identification in order to go with that. But one of the disadvantages is that it could miss peaks that are lowly represented of cell types. And this is one thing that that tries to guarantee our uh, art. Also. They, they say that even when SNAP attack have the ability to use the same properties that they are implementing, uh, they see that the memory of the computer resources that require exceeds uh, memory limits for a common in computational infrastructure. Uh, next step uh, after to identify these peaks is to, to run the dimensionality reduction in the clustering. So here I think that is very relevant because there are a lot of details about when can we pick up one option from other because they use different techniques. Like for example, I emphasize in this because I'm working with Signal. Uh, uh, Signal uses a uh, Latin semantic index indexing uh, that it has a very specific uh, Process that I can summarize in the in in the transformation of data following the TFIDE normalization, uh, followed by the the dimensionality reduction applied in singular palette composition. But all these steps are running once and directly in the processing data, and there is no uh, refining of the of the feature selection. While, for example, in the dimensionality reduction method that incorporates uh, RR, they use a variant of this method that is called iterative LS uh, Latin semantic indexing that is referred like the refined method because it starts with a round of this, of this process, but followed by uh, an iterative refinement of the features. In these features, it would be uh, included the region speaks terms of transitional factors used for the analysis. So the iterative uh, workflow uh, contributes to identify or to try to keep variability, but mostly in these in these uh, regions where we are expected to have very low 
um, a very low signal. So the iteration not only helps to eliminate noise, but also to catch information that is related to this kind of, of, of regions. So like this is make it iteratively, so it could be an answer for when we have uh, difficulties to identify the biological signal. And in this, um, in this figure that is the extended figure five, they explain a bit of the process that I also that I briefly explained in the previous slide. But what I want to point out here is the panel D, because in the panel D they uh they they are showing examples of the of the arc arc uh, using the iterative LSI. The snap attack uses the, the landmark dimensional uh, mass. I don't remember all the, the layers and sigma using the, the last semantic index. So we can see here that they have uh, three columns. The first column is to look at the performance using low quality cells. And the second column is to look at the medium quality of, uh, of cells and also the high the high quality cells that includes a different number of fragments by cell. One thing that really caught my attention here is that it looks, for example, that when the when when it's applied uh, this approach in low quality data, uh, as we can see here, uh, it's not attack. Uh, have difficulties to identify or to properly, yes, identify this this cluster, the, the cluster, and to perform the cluster, and it, it looks with a lot of troubles when working with with low quality cells. But uh, in the medium, for example, when working in snap attack with the medium quality, they tend to overspread the clusters, and with high quality, happens something similar. So. This is something that, I don't know, it should be published in order to understand well what is happening here. But in the case of signal, for example, it also uh, cannot split very well, the cluster with low quality, but it looks like that with medium quality, it can retain this information. And also we can see probably in over clustering when using high quality cells, when it has a lot of fragments by cell. And in R, indeed, uh, they have also some kind of troubles to identify low quality. I mean, if we have cells containing only 1,000 uh, fragments by cell, it could be a challenge really to, to make a proper clustering. Uh, with the median quality, it looks pretty well, I think, uh, pretty similar to the signal. Uh, you map that we have here, and also with uh, high color, I don't know, but it looks pretty well and not over -clustering. So this is something that I think that is interesting uh, because I was recently working with, with different arguments to, to perform clustering. And also in the supplementary figure seven, they made a comparison of estimated LSI in R and estimated uh, LDM in a stamp attack, in a specifically in the bone marrow cells. Uh, they point specifically to this data set because it contains a lot of tissue types. So this is just only to show that uh, in the panel L, um, we have um, in the first columns, um, the, the estimated by the LSI by R, and in the next two columns, we have the estimated by the LDM by snap attack. So we can see here the different uh, different uh, number of cells used for this. And again, we can see the working with small number of cells. It's really difficult for the snap attack um, to catch this information. Uh, it looks like the working with 500 cells and beyond. Um, the tools indeed can cache uh, some kind of biological information. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is to reflect 
a big reflection about if, what about SIGNAC and versus R because they only base uh, the the advanced analysis or they rank their analysis against uh, SNAP attack but not against SIGNAC. So the only thing that I can add here is that uh, we need to take into account that we have different uh, normalization and dimensionality reduction steps. I mean, it's the same Latin semantic index but with some variation because here we have this iterative refining resolution. Uh, also, uh, in terms of the of the resolution that, that we have in when using Sigma, uh, Sigma uh, maybe then some kind of not informative information, but this should be clearly show when we have the clusters. And, and here in the case of the approach that uses R, R uh, well, yes, in, it focus on this informative information, but because this has this iterative way to reassign, to reassign the nodes to the clusters. In case of, in, in terms of the computer resources or the complexity, uh, to implement SIGNAC uh, in terms of a resource is simpler and faster. Uh, we know that the iterative LSI is more computer intensive, but as they have in, in implemented the arrow, the arrow file, so they could fix this issue. And the, the output, well, it depends also um, about this previous step that the were, were performing. So I think that, for example, the the LSI with the TF, TF IDF that is implemented by Sigma works well when we have small data sets. And we can capture the biological signal. But if we have large data set with a lot of 100,000 of cells or even close to the million, probably it's better to use an iterative approach. And well, here in the in this figure that the figure two uh, is just to show optimized genes called inference models that include prediction of gene expression. So um, I just want to mention the gene scores represent the inferred gene expression that is critical to identify clusters. So they rank here in the panel B, we can see that they rank a lot of methods to compute uh, this process and try to identify what is the best that we can implement it in the tool. So they rank a total of benchmark a total of 56 models. Uh, and they put, uh, let's say, uh, make the conclusion that the best model to implement or to, or to run the gene escorts inference is the model 42. Then we can see here in, that was tested in two different data types, the PDMC in the bone, in the bone marrow. <clears throat> the colors here, uh, it's a combination of different properties that are implemented in the models. For example, this like, uh, like color. Uh, for, for example, the, the yellow is the gene body extends plus exponential plus gene boundaries. So are different properties that we're combining to to improve the model. So at the end, uh, this variance includes a lot of factors like regions included, sizes of the regions in different ways, applies to each one of these regions. And, and well, R now uses this optimized G score model that they label at the number 42 for downstream analysis. And they say that this is the best they could rank in terms to identify the biological signal that they were looking at. Also, uh, in the figure three, they talk again about uh, how the tool works in order to, to process massive scales. And well, what I want to just emphasize this is something that I mentioned before is that they point out or highlight a lot of the scalability, working with millions of cells, and then again makes plots to 
to uh, to look at these details uh, in the data input and the gene metrics performance. Uh, and also in the dimensionality reduction, well, just to emphasize the the they uh, use this iterative Latin semantic index. Um, and the clustering, they were able to identify even clusters that they considered with very low signal. And they also uh, can, uh, can make visualizations uh, related with the with these um with these uh this is the gene scores against the motif enrichment. So they can uh, like to present these for correlations against the different clusters identified there are present here in the y-axis uh, regarding the motif enrichment that they can find. And well, the data indeed can be integrated with other data type, like the like single cell NAC data. And to mention this, before to, to mention this, um, I want to to show that they also to to show um, how, how are the signals related with these accessibility regions, and also to show where can we find the peaks, and also superinances related with the data. They incorporate and integrate our genome browser that works in real time. So this is a figure depicting this. That is in the supplemental figure then. So in, interactively, we can select uh, the, the genomic region also, as well as the genes, and also to move the, the size of the window to look at the tracks. Before to continue with this, I briefly want to explain what the kind of information we are looking at there. So I just extract this piece of the, of the, of the plot, just to mention that um, here in the index axis, we have the genomic coordinates. For example, we are looking at the chromosome with a specific region. And in the in the way axis, we are looking the the signal int intensity of the coverage. Uh, in other words, we are looking the different clusters where they were identified. So each one of these uh, like rows that we can see here are uh, related with this specific cluster. But can also be a comparison among experiments or treatments of quantums. So it depends on how this can be fixed. So here we are looking at a specific gene that is in this line in blue. And these specific genes, um, we can look that uh, in each one of the tracks we have these like these like uh, small mountains that are like the peaks, and we have also uh, annotations related to the specific cis regulatory elements that can be uh, transcription, uh, transcription factors or enhancers. And for example, that where are peaks inside of the region of the gene, we are called these cis regulatory elements with active transcription. For those that are uh, outside of the gene region, we call like these uh, cis regulatory elements. But also there is, um, a, a um, another way to to interpret the data where where to complement the the interpretation of the data because we have different kind of peaks we have narrow peaks but we can also have uh, some uh, more broad peaks and in general a description of this is that these narrow peaks typically associate with a specific transcription factor but in the cases when there are of broad peaks, we have association with a lot of, of these regions, so they are called the super regions. And also these arcs that we can see here are related with co-accessibility uh, relation between these peaks. And there are some tools like this, like arc, arc the, the intensity of the color, the peaks where it's more strong, the relation between the specific peaks. So this is something that they incorporate in the tool, and they offer some examples of how they could identify particular regions. For example, I like this one, because in this one, we clearly can see the chromosome 5 related with these particular genes. 
that there are regions with super nicer that are layered with uh, most of the centers that they look at, but also they have particular, very specific uh, peak identification layer with these particular clusters, like 13 and 15, or, or this chunk of clusters that, that they can look at. So that is very interesting the way the, the tool can visualize all these tracks. Well, lastly, we have the 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 data is possible integrate the data with uh, in a multi op approach with single cellular analysis data. They have a specific functions to do this uh, to uh, say that uh, that is all at clusters. And also, they they can play uh, with the select find clusters function that they incorporate, but also are allows uh, the identification of cluster distance scan. So there is a, a couple of options that you can scroll by yourself in the in the manual. There is a lot of information related with that. Yeah. It looks so easy to implement, but I really have not tried it by myself. Okay, uh, and also I don't deep in this, but they have a figure, a, a full figure to explain uh, how they really could incorporate or integrate uh, an approach without the necessity to import external tools to identify a uh, cell trajectory. So this is a very, um, they have a very a long explanation about how this can be done. So just I want to mention that this is possible. Uh, this is not part of my, the analysis that I actually run, but uh, they incorporate this feature here. They also add, a summary in some way of the comparison against different kind of tools. But I just want to say that this need to be checked carefully because it was published in 2021. So the same author says that many of these tools like Snap Attack and Signal was indeed in development process. So there are some features that probably they are important right now, but that at the time that they check this, they weren't. So just uh, need to read carefully this and double check if indeed uh, this is the actual uh, state of the art. Uh, just to say that the three tools that are mostly used for this kind of analysis, uh, all of these incorporate data normalization, dimensionality reduction, pre-calling, integration with RNA data, clustering and visualization, and co-accessibility analysis. Also, they incorporate motif analysis, and they are open source. So let's say that the big question for me is when to use R or signal. So for me, all this relies on the kind of normalization and the steps that they use to uh, previous to the clustering identification, because there are different, um, let's say, ways to to process information. Also, if we have million of cells, well, probably there is no question we should use a software like RR. But if our data set is conservative in size, probably signal works well. Uh, also, well, if you have issues because, for example, you suspect of that you have probably a lot of doublets in your data, probably R could go well with that. Or if you want to perform such trajectory, also probably you should use RR. But if this is not part of your analysis, probably it's not necessary to use it, or probably yes. And also if it's important for you, they are supported by different by different community support and developments. And that's it.